Well, this morning I want to speak to you about the pride of life. The pride of life. First John chapter 2. First John is in the New Testament, please. In case you are looking around Genesis, come backwards towards Revelation. Amen. First John chapter two. Are we there? I'm reading from verse 13. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I have written to you, children, because you know the father. I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who has been from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. Verse 15. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... And the last of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away and also it lasts. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. Amen. 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 Now, the author of this book, First John, is saying that I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him. And because you know him who has been from the beginning. And then he says, I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. And he says, I'm writing to you, young men, again, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. Now, you would think that if Paul is writing, if John is writing to fathers, because they have known him from the beginning, and if he's writing to them because he feels that they have had an encounter with God, it is amazing that he would say, love not the world. Because you would think that when you have known God from the beginning, there can be no love of the world in you. And he's writing to the young men also because they have overcome the evil one and because they are strong. And the word of God abides in them. So you think, if I'm strong, and I'm a strong person of faith, and I have overcome the evil one, how come after that I'm being admonished that I should not love the world? It means that no matter how spiritual we are, there can be patches and pockets of the love of the world in our lives. No matter how long we have walked with the Lord for, there can be idols in our lives. And the beginning of this, we says, I write to you that you may abstain from idols. And then in verse 15, it comes and says, the reason why I'm writing to you is not because you are deficient Christians. The reason why I'm writing to you is not because you don't know the Father. The reason why I'm writing to you is not because the word of God does not dwell in you. The reason why I'm writing to you is not because you have not overcome the evil one. You have achieved all these things. But I still have to caution you not to love the world. Amen. Amen. Love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Amen. Amen. Now keep your finger there and go with me to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. 
the pride of life. Genesis is not the last book in the Bible. Amen. Are we there? Reading from verse 6. Okay, let's read from verse 5 so that it makes more sense. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Hallelujah. Now, the devil hasn't changed his tactics since the time of the Garden of Eden. Hallelujah. He is still attacking us from the three vantage points of the last of the eyes. The lust of the flesh and the pride of life. So when he came to Eve, it was the same strategy. Hallelujah. Sometimes he may change his mode of operation, but it's basically the same. And the Bible says that when the woman saw, the seeing is the problem. When she saw that it was good for food hmm, and that it was to make one wise, so what she saw translated into her thinking, the last of the eyes. And many times as women, we last for that which we can see. And we last for things that glitter. And we last for things that shine. But all that glitters is not gold. It's not even a verse, but the world has discovered that. Hallelujah. And when she saw that the fruit was good for food, she had been seeing the fruit all along. But this seeing was a different seeing. When she saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes. A delight to the eyes. And that the tree was desirable to make one wise. So she saw, first of all, the tree. And then she saw certain qualities that it was good for food. The flesh. And that it was a delight to the eyes. You see? <laughs> and then it was desirable to make one wise. These are the qualities that led her. Good for food, a delight to the eyes, and desirable. These are the three steps. So it's not just the scene, but what you see. Amen. It was good for food. And then desirable. A delight to the eyes. You see, sometimes when you go to shops, you don't know why they look so shiny. The jewelry is enticing you. You are looking. When we were in transit in Amsterdam, I was saying to my two assistants, do you know why this shop is glittering? They had written jewelry. And they said, oh, it's because of the jewelry. I said, no. Not only what's in it, but in every cupboard or cabinet or display, they have put lights. So when the light falls on the metal and then it shines back to you, say, ash! <laughs> A delight to the eyes. And the shops have learned all these things to make you buy. And so they display it in that way. And Satan is also busily displaying things in that way for us. And we don't see that the lights are a falsehood. 
It's something that embellishes what you are seeing and makes you feel that it's something so glorious. It may be nice, but there's a certain artificial attraction that's put on it. A delight to the eyes. And desirable. It is when it's a delight, you go nearer. And then it becomes desirable. That one, it has transferred now to a want, a liking, a longing to make one wise. But who told you that you were not wise? The Bible says you were created in the image of God. Who told you that you were not wise? The Bible says male and female made he them. But when you are being led by desire, you see the first step, you can return. And you see. Then number two, good for food, you can return. Then desirable, the pool becomes stronger. And then now you reach out your hands to take, to make you wise. And the only reason why you are taking it to make you wise is you are not satisfied with the state you are in. And you feel that there is something else. You see, God made all the trees in the garden. But he said, just one, just this one, leave it for me. And Satan can make you concentrate on what you think has been taken away from you. So much so that you don't even enjoy or concentrate on the many trees that are in the garden. <laughs> and I am sure that the many trees in the garden were also good for food. But because it has been withheld from you as it were, and it's for your own good, Satan has to come and tell you that God is not giving you this because he's actually a cheat. And God is not giving you this because, you know, he's not a very straightforward person. And Satan said, when you eat it, you'll be like God. But you were already like God because you were already created in the image of God. Male and female made he them. But he has to use deception. And in the midst of the conversation with Satan and the back and forth, we are not alert. As the Bible says, be sober for your adversary. Be sober because when you are not sober, and you are so taken in by desires and drives and so many strong desires, then you can't think anymore. But soberness makes you think. He says, in the day that you take it, you'll be like God. And that's what God is trying to prevent you from being. And he's trying to prevent you from being that because he doesn't want any rivalry. But God knew that he has created you as a human being. And you are better off not knowing good and evil. You are better off knowing just good. Just good. And Eve took the apple. And then she gave Adam also. From that time, the sort of order that God had set was reversed. The man was to provide for the woman. Now suddenly, the woman was providing for the man. And the order had changed in creation. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible says through one man, sin entered into the world. I've always asked why God didn't say through one woman. Because God will not take your responsibility away from you. It doesn't matter that it's Eve who brought it. It doesn't matter it's the way, Lord, you know, the way she presented it and the way she served it. It's all really, no, you are the head. And God puts it solely and squarely at your door. It says through one man, one Adam, the whole creation sinned. It says the woman was deceived, yes. But it says that as for sin entering the world, it was through one man. And through the second Adam, restoration also came. Now Satan uses also this same tactics. Come with me to look for. Luke chapter 4. Help me, Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 4. Matthew 4 will also work. Luke 4, I think. See? Luke chapter 4. This one. I 
and Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led about by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they had ended, he became hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I'll give you all this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And he led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Hallelujah. Amen. The Bible says here that Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned to the Jordan and was led by the Holy Ghost into the desert, into the wilderness. When you return from baptism and you are full of the Holy Ghost, could it be that you will be tempted by the love of this world? And the love of this world comprises the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But this morning, I'll be talking specifically about the pride of life. Amen. Amen. And if Satan tempted Jesus, why are you worried when you are tempted? As if you are a bad person. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Peter said, why are you so surprised whenever you are tempted? <laughs> and why is it that when things occur to you and you are tempted, you feel that, oh, I'm dirty. I am not worthy. I'm finished. It's the devil. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Because even the Son of God was tempted. And what does temptation mean? Temptation means the urge to do that which you know is wrong. <laughs> and it's the Holy Ghost that led Jesus into the wilderness. You better be sure it's the Holy Ghost that leads you when you go through a wilderness experience. Because some of us, we go there, but on our own. We take our own bus, our own abonnement, and we say, I'm getting down in the wilderness, and I'm going to walk there. That's different. But Jesus was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness. And let me digress here a bit to say that as you walk with God, you will by all means have wilderness patches in your journey. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter how much of the Holy Ghost you are filled with. That's what even makes you a candidate to be in the wilderness. Because God will fill you before he sends you there. And he knows that you will be sustained. He knows that you will be okay. Hallelujah. But when he was going, no angel went with him. No disciple went with him. He was alone. And many times... When you are going through a wilderness experience, you will be alone. When Jacob wrestled with God, he was alone. When Elijah went to sit under the juniper tree and said, let me die, I'm not better than my fathers, he was alone. Because there's a certain knowledge of God that should come to you personally. That nobody can share with you. Only God, you alone. You, your God, and Satan. Now do, let's see. And the Bible says Jesus fasted. For 40 days and 40 nights. And afterwards, he was hungry. But so why we get hungry two days, not after. <laughs> we get hungry at 12 o'clock, not after. But the Son of God, he was unhungered afterwards. But when he was fasting and all that, Satan hadn't yet appeared. You know, it's like, oh, be there. But I think that God was using all that to fortify him. God will never give you something that is beyond your strength. The Bible says with every temptation, he will provide the way of escape. The way. 
but usually we don't ask him for the way. We are so overwhelmed with the temptation, so overwhelmed with the problem, we don't see the window. When the window is open and God says, the window is open, he says, oh no, I'm used to the door. <laughs> if the door doesn't open, I'm not going. I'm used to the door. God is saying, no, there's an emergency exit through the back. Go through the back. That's the way through this temptation. So, no, I'm the regular guy. I usually use regular routes, and I don't like these type of emergency exits and things like that. And I have learned in every trial and temptation to pray that God open my eyes to see the way of escape. Because with every temptation, there's a tailored way of escape. Now, if Satan had the audacity to come and talk to the Son of God, why do you think he will not have the audacity to come to you? Hallelujah! He came and he stood before Jesus. And he had the audacity to make suggestions. You see, Satan has no shame. And no embarrassment, you know? He comes and says that, if, if, conditional, if you are the son of God, if you really want to prove to be your identity and who you are, then command these stones to become bread. Meanwhile, the main reason why you have come to him is because he's the son of God. But he will always put doubt in your mind as to your relationship with God. In the time of temptation, he throws stones of guilt and condemnation. If you are the son of God. Because if you were, you will not be tempted. If you are the son of God, command these stones to be. And when you are at that point, you don't need diamonds. You don't need bank accounts. You don't need a full tank of petrol. It's bread you need. So Satan will bring what you need. <laughs> and what is difficult to say no to. Love not the world. And this one is the last of the flesh. Your flesh wants to eat. Your flesh wants to break the fast. After all, the fast is over. It's just that there are stones. And you're not getting bread. And if you are the son of God, and you really have all that power, command these stones to become bread. Meet your fleshly needs now. If you are the son of God. Amen. Amen. If you, are, if you are the son of God, show me a building or manufacture a building or bring a car. It will not be a temptation because at that time, you are not looking for transportation. Your body is craving for food. And the desires in themselves are not wrong. But the timing and the method of meeting those needs, therein lies the trap. Amen. And many of us I would have said, good idea. After all, God knows that fasting is not easy. And there's no bread here. And I'm the son of God. And I can turn these stones into bread. But let me ask you, why should that suggestion come from Satan? When it comes from Satan, it's not a good thing. It's shrouded. It's disguised. And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Now the aspect of him that was being tempted was the man part. But Satan was challenging his divinity. So if you are the son of God, then command these stones to become bread. So if you are the son of God, if you are as divine as you say, become carnal. If you are as divine as you say, meet a carnal need now. And let's see. The last of the flesh. And then he took him to a place where he could see the glory of the kingdoms. A good perspective, a good vantage point, a good observatory so that you can see everything properly. And he says, look, all these things belong to me and the glory of them. And the glory of them. So if you would just bow down a little, I'll give all this to you. The last of the eyes, what you see, the glory, the glitter, the drive to go that way. And Jesus said, it is written. Many of us, when we face temptation, we don't know the Bible. And so we don't say it is written. We say, what were they saying in church? What did they say during praise and worship? What did my friend say? What has my friend experienced? What did my mother say? 
But it is written, it's not part of our vocabulary. But if we will know what God has written in a given situation, we will use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And we will say, it is written. Amen. Amen. When your marriage is going through a problem, you will say, it is written. What God has put together, let no man put asunder. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. If it depends on you. But sometimes it doesn't depend on you. I had a friend, she knew that it is written. She wants to do that it is written. But the man says he's going. And the man is a member of the church. A shepherd. But for him, it is written doesn't count. And many of us Christians, we don't have any nevertheless in our lives. The nevertheless is the referee that blows the whistle when you are manifesting. And says, time out. Who have time. And then you say, no, I'm going to play extra time. The word of God is that referee. Peter said, we have told all night and we have caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word. You see, I've had all these experiences. And, 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 and my body doesn't really feel like going back to the sea to try and fish. And, but because you said it, it makes a difference. So nevertheless, Jesus, no, I don't feel like dying. In the garden of Gethsemane, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So if it be, well, let this cup pass. If being crucified is only a cup, then your problems are a teaspoon. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Said if it be possible, let this cup, not a bucket, not a tub, but a cup. So he said, they didn't mind me. They didn't look at me. Yours is a teaspoon or those drops, you know. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And then he brings him to the pride of life. And that is the desire and the drive to be proud. To show off. To impress. To have people think about us in a certain way. To have us put on a pedestal in a certain way. And that is the place that Satan brought Jesus to. <laughs> Many things are threefold. We have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And usually the last and third one is the power unit. And so the Bible says, and so abideth faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest is love. When you go into the temple, you have the outer temple, the inner temple, and the holy of holies. That is the place. And then when you have the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, that is the area Amen. where Satan would like to reach you. It says if you are the son of God, show off. Do some antics. Do something to show us that the Lord is with you. Do something to show us that you are great. Therein lies the fall. The Bible says, pride cometh before a fall. And pride is subtle. It is like chemical warfare. You know, when you hear helicopters, scatters, those are not the lethal ones. Chemical warfare is silent. And it just wipes out minds. <laughs> and pride is something that can be easily disguised. And it's something that you can't easily see. And it is one of the things that God said, even the look of it, I abhor. What the things that God hates, a proud look. Not even that you are proud of, but the look. <laughs> a proud look is an abomination unto God. And Satan says, if you are the son of God, just fall down and then let angels come and let's see how great you are and then everybody will believe. And Jesus said, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. Amen. Amen. This is not the time. Satan, only you and I are in the wilderness. And so I should display for you for what? And then Satan quotes scripture. I tell you, Satan comes to church. <laughs> Satan stands behind the pulpit sometimes. Amen. Amen. I have been in a church where... Hmm. I was a lodge member, you know, when I was young. 
They said that they have to get juvenile lodge so that as they grow older, the juveniles will grow from juvenile to youth, and then they will take the place of the older people. And I've attended meetings in the, the lodge, the ark, where there's one eye. And when something is said and they want to clap, they clap with their feet. That's how they clap. And they come with a sword from the back. It's a big Bible in the middle. But they don't say Jesus. They say the great architect. And we were told, you are not supposed to tell anybody what happens in this temple. And if you tell somebody, you will fall ill. And my big sisters came to call me. So what happens there? I said, if I tell you, they say I'll fall ill. So you won't fall ill. See, but I was so terrified. I tell you, when I told them, I fell ill. Yeah. When they are opening the door, they knock three times. And there's a little shutter. They look in before they allow us to go in. And they read chapters of the Bible, but not the New Testament. The Bible is about all Old Testament and... The great master said, and but Jesus, son of God, the blood, the cross, no. But then when I go to church on Sunday, the main grandmaster of the lodge is the one standing behind the pulpit, ministering to us. So when I say Satan stands even behind the pulpit, it's by experience. Amen. Show off the pride of life so that we will see who you really are. And then when you fall down like that, we'll see whether the angels will come and minister to you. And when Jesus said that to the devil, the devil left. And I'm saying that Satan quotes scripture. You see, don't be deceived by the quotation of scripture. Don't be deceived by things that look spiritual because in the last days, things are confusing. And you have to know. But many Christians don't know. So any storm, that, any wind that blows... Children to and fro, tossed to and fro by any wind of doctrine. And we are led more by our stomachs, the turning of stone into bread, than a seeking for God himself. We are led by our pe- what we see as our perceived needs. So if I go here, my need will be met. If I, I go here, so I need a prophetic word here. Pro- the prophetic ministry is profound. But maybe for that problem, you don't need a prophetic word. You need to sit down and study the word of God so that you can say, it is written. When temptation comes, you can say it is written. Hallelujah. And many women fall prey to the prophetic because you are just told what to do. You don't have to read any Bible. You don't have to memorize any scripture for it to be the sword of the spirit. You are just told that, sister... Your sister is doing this, then you you take off on a tangent. The pride of life. But Jesus got all these things, but not through Satan's way. He didn't turn the stones into bread, but he had enough bread later on to feed 5,000. He didn't turn the stones into bread, but he himself became the bread for you and I, so that he would be broken. He was the bread of life. And Satan was now bringing fake things. But he will use it to entice us and to confuse us. He had the glory. The Bible says at the mention of the name, every knee shall bow. But Satan was giving it to him in another way. Oh, why don't you just, I'll give you the glory thereof. He had angels because when Pontius Pilate was misbehaved, he said, I just have to call my father. And legions of angels will be assembled on my behalf. And when he was in the garden of of Gethsemane, the Bible says an angel came and strengthened him. He didn't even have to prove that angels were with him. But the pride of life pushes us to want to prove something. In the ministry, as you walk with God, you will be tempted to be proud. And you can easily forget that you are a preacher. And now begin to think that you are a film star. Amen. Amen. So now you're not looking at oh, what God is saying. You're looking at how do I look? How have I done my hair? How, have I done? how do I look to the people? Okay, so when I turn left and then I turn left, you have to And the real reason for which God put you behind the sacred desk is missing. Something else has taken place. And yet people see you and then they say, oh, you're doing so well. 
But you know in your heart that you have gone another way. Hallelujah. Preachers have been featured in Vogue magazines. That, you know, they dress this way and it is the world. And it gives you things in a certain way. And it's a subtle way of being proud. But pride is like a chemical weapon, so you don't see it. Hallelujah. And because of that, our churches, our fellowships, our relationships are all suffering because of the pride of life. You have to manifest. You have to be seen on the stage. When we don't let you see, sing as a lead singer, you are going. The pride of life. You must be on display by all means. <laughs> That's rivalry. Sometimes between husbands and wife in the ministry. Because everybody wants to be seen. Hallelujah. I met a bishop in one of the African countries. A lady bishop. Very powerful. When she steps there, you will see. Her stature alone makes the place vibrate. <laughs> and she was telling me, you know, she was starting her ministry. She was the founder of the church. Then she had a younger pastor, five years younger than her, helping and assisting the work. And then as time went on, she got a word from the Lord that this was her husband. She was telling me herself. And I said, hey, so what did you do? She said, I, I said, God, how can this be my husband? She, she, he calls me mama. <laughs> so how can he be my husband? As for this one, so well, she prayed about it and she said, God, if it's you, then take it from here. So one day after a prayer meeting on a Friday, the man said, oh, mama, I'm going. And she said, oh, okay. Bless you, so he was traveling or so. And they said, Mama, please, can I see you under the tree? So they left the house. They came, sir. And she said, yes. <laughs> and the guy said, oh, I just want to say that when I go where I'm traveling to over the weekend, I'll miss you. <laughs> and she said, oh, I will also miss you. <laughs> and so from there, the veil was torn apart and then... There was a flow. So she has been married for some years. So I was asking her, so your church, now the church has grown. She has a very powerful women's ministry. And she was even asking me to come to that country to preach at her, whatever. And she said, um, so I said, so how is it? You are the founder. Now you have married the assistant. So how do you do the church? Do you give the, the assistant duties because he's your head at home? How do you? She said, ah, uh ah, -uh, my sister. When prophetess and apostle meet, it's not easy in the house. <laughs> I said, really? She said, that, hey, a prophetess has come, an apostle too has come, and we are both working in the church. The church is shivering. <laughs> so I asked her, so how do you do the preaching? She said, I preach one month, he preaches the next month. I preach one month, he preaches the other month. And I asked our pastor there, so this young man, I mean, how does he look? He said, oh, very, very, very feeble. <laughs> 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 but I'm saying that even in the ministry, the pride of life, the competition, rivalry, why do you have to be seen by all means? <laughs> Why do people have to call you lady pastor before you do the work? And why do you want to be a lady pastor in the first place? Is it a post that they are sharing? Or is it because you want to do God's work and that God has called you? In the church at the Kodesh, I don't preach every Sunday, and happily so. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I preach on Mother's Day, and I preach if we have daughter. And in Ghana, in my own church, I don't have many daughter conventions. I have them round in Accra, the north, and other places. But in my own church, I don't even remember to put them on the schedule. So this year, they came to see me and said that this thing must stop. I said, what? <laughs> so, you know, every time they are being scheduled, that we do, I said, oh, we have powerful preachers here. Go for it, sister. So it's like every other year. And some of the times when I've preached, people have written to me, dear lady pastor, 
I wonder why the men don't give you the pulpits. Some of the letters I've kept, you know, and, I, and, and Lady Pastor, you know, I think you are more anointed than they mention the names. And if you are also a fool, you say, oh, it's true. Actually, I need to start flexing my muscles in the church. God has called me and my ministry is being hindered. That is the wrong route. And Satan is using the wrong route to minister to And you too, you are receiving it fully. In fact, I have never even mentioned it to Bishop that, oh, this person wrote and said this. No, I just treat it as it should be treated. Put aside. <laughs> One man said to me, you see, is it because they are afraid you will shine? I'm the wife, oh, and they are telling me that how much more other people? Amen. Amen. But I thank God for the fulfillment of being happy in what I do. Yeah. And the things that I do in the church are not on display. You, you will not even know them. And so I think that many people think, oh, she just dresses nice. comes, first lady. And then I just sit in front of, that's my work. <laughs> Amen. Amen. But my husband says, Oh, you do well in the trenches. I work in the trenches. The places where I, when I counsel people one-on-one, -on -one, every week on my schedule, it's a quiet thing that happens. Nobody knows. I have counseled this person. You have changed this person's life. It's never on any program. It's never on any billboard. It's never on any brochure. But I'm fulfilled. Because I feel that that is where God has placed me and what God wants me to do. But you have a lot of temptation with the pride of life. There are times in the church they are doing a program and they forgot it to even tell me. And if the pride of life is to rear its head, you say that these people, where were they when the church started? You see? And do they know the price that has been paid? Today they, they, they sit in the Kodesh. But we have come from school of hygiene. Do they know where, where, where we are coming from? Before canteen. And because of that, sometimes you can even destroy the church because you are making a reputation for yourself and then for yourself. But the Bible says that Jesus, he made himself of no reputation. Many of us, it's people who make us of no reputation, but we ourselves don't make ourselves of no reputation. That's another level. And if maybe you were an associate pastor and then they came and said, why don't they let you preach? They shine. They it will start ministering to you. They are sitting on my gift. I now need to be released into the, onto the nations. I have to go onto the nations. Amen. Amen. So why do they always call her to be the lead singer? Her voice is not nice too. When she raises the tune, it doesn't. And I, don't they see me? Everything you do, we have to say thank you. Oh, Beverly, what a blessing you are to the ministry. And the day that we forget... The pride of life. And it's subtle. Nobody will even know that that's what's going on through you. Amen. When people don't say thank you to you, and they are not grateful, the reason why you are upset is because of the pride of life. You feel that you have done something, and that they should acknowledge you. It's when they say the list, and want to thank all those people who have made this a success, and this a sister, they say, eh. I mean, after all my sleepless nights, my name is not even on the list. This church, eh, this church, it's finished. I'm going. And then you go home and you tell your husband. Do you see they didn't mention my name? And men have a way of dismissing such things. Oh, it doesn't matter. They didn't mention your name. So, I mean, why are you? Is it a big deal? So, huh, I knew that's what you say. You, you never back me. You. Sounds like you, eh? But God is using all that to take away the pride of life. It's nice to be appreciated. It's nice for people to say thank you. But that should not be your mainstay. And when it doesn't happen, it should not bring bitterness into the church. The pride of life is operating fully. Amen. One pastor said to me, Sister Mami, you have to educate the church on what you do. Because in fact, 
Since my husband, my wife came to work in your department, I have now seen what you do. I never knew. You do this, you do primary school, you do orphanage, you do pastoral care, you do protocol, you do church boards. I think you should write all down. Because I think people take you for granted. They don't know what, you know? But if you are going to display what you do, then God will say, okay, you have rewarded yourself already. <laughs> I don't have nothing to do with it. The pride of life, that is why your marriage is going through what it's going through. Because pride will not let you say sorry. So, but but I, I was not wrong. He's always wrong. Peter said, if you suffer for what is right, blessed are you. I never knew you could suffer for doing right. But when I read that verse, in fact, it was a very sobering time for me. When I read that verse, I said, God, I don't like this verse. It's not a very pleasant verse. But when you suffer for right, doing right, blessed are you. So you are doing what is right, but you rather are suffering. God will bless you for that. The pride of life. That is what makes you feel that you should not pay tithe. My thing that I've got and God is coming for it. Yeah. You see, there was a man in our church. He wasn't our church. His wife was in our church. And he was, how do I say it? A signed and confirmed unbeliever. And he could do so many. He had manifestations. I'm sure I've told you about him before. When you go and visit his wife, he comes in his pants to open the door. And then one of our pastors told him, you know, every time we come here, you come in your underpants. And it's a bit embarrassing for us, so please. But because I said that it's my house, is it not my <laughs> It's my house. You have come, and you are now coming to dictate to me. I will not listen to what you are saying. <laughs> and then one time he asked one of our pastors, but why did they send you here? He said, oh. Bishop couldn't come, and your wife has had an accident, so he sent me to come. He said, Next time, tell Bishop not to send apprentice pastors here. <laughs> the pride of life. He will come to church, not to attend the church, but to come and face his wife. And when he comes, I just said, I tell him, Sir, please park here. He parks in the middle of the road. And when he parks in the middle, nobody can park. And when they call him, he just insults all the ashes in a row. I have never seen such a. Uh, Misbehavior. <laughs> you know? All these are present. Clear out, clear out. I'm looking for him all night. Then he comes and the wife is praying. Kebara mashandana. Then he comes, coming to face the wife. Hey, when you left home, in the midst of everybody. <laughs> you have to see to believe. When you left, you left the door. Who did you? Then the wife, you know, we are praying. So people are moving up and down and you can't really tell. So she also moves as if the man is not looking for her. So as the man is started, because of the shouts, you can't hear. So the man is manifested. Oh, kebala And many times she'll call and say, Lady Pastor, I'm leaving this marriage. A major neighbor is here. I'm leaving this marriage. Take your time. Let God fight for his heart. But let God. The one day the man came to pick his wife and children from church. And he met Bishop. He said, do you know the work I do? That you say God says I should pay tithe. Bishop said, oh. But I've not spoken to you personally. He said, I know it's in the Bible. And you people. <laughs> you expect me to pay tithe, don't you? I will never pay tithe. Because my tithe is you, you pastors. My tithe is your whole year's uh, uh, salary. When you have people who earn small, small, you can tell them to pay tithe. But a major man like me, in my BM, in my, I, I cannot pay any tithe. I mean, he kept on misbehaving and misbehaving and misbehaving. So a terrible disease struck him. Yes, years after. And then the same, the same wife. Taking him here, taking him there, flying him here. Flying him there. And then the man now comes to church. Every time they say, if you are here with your tithe, lift your hand. <laughs> Come forward. He's now very lean. Comes. Yeah, he prays. And then he brought his friend who was dying of cancer. And he told Bishop, you see, 
There's nothing on earth that matters. He took the preaching and preached the guy full. Bishop said, you are now an evangelist. And you are now more powerful than I am. He has joined one of our branches, very vibrant. Because the pride of life has gone. <laughs> but, but don't let a bad experience be what brings you to God. It should not be. Amen. Amen. I mean, the way he used to talk. I won't pay any tithe. I said to him once, that, look, even we pastors who work, we also pay tithe. It's a Christian principle. It's a basic Christian doctrine. It's not something for giants. It's something for babies. And we give because there's nothing that we didn't receive. What have we that we did not receive? <laughs> Hallelujah. What do we have that we did not receive? But this man would none of it. But now, then he had his 50th birthday. He's come very spiritual. <laughs> he said, my 50th birthday, I don't want a party. I want a church service. And he had a major church service. And he called all his unbeliever friends. And so they came. Optional speeches. They said that for this man to, to celebrate his birthday in a church, God is great. <laughs> God is great. One of them said, I like what I see. In fact, they were so surprised that, this, that the man was saying that, you know, when you meet God, then really, what, because now you have nothing. You can't work. You have been declared disabled. That your flashy car is no more there. I have not lived so long, but I've seen it from riches to rags, as it were. And now he lifts up his hands and he says, Jesus is Lord. Amen. Don't let that be your story. <laughs> That's what has happened to Europe. Pride. The pride of life. Hallelujah. It's ruining churches. Pride. If he does, I should do. If he goes, I should go. If he does this, I must do that. It's bringing problems. If he has, I must have. It's only in the church that we feel that everybody is equal. When we go to work, we don't, we don't say that, why does my boss have this? And I don't. We understand it. But when we come to the church, we say, there are many times I've come to the church, this new site. When I come, the ushers say, Madam, go and park over there. They don't know me. <laughs> because the ushers are from the Bible school, and the Bible school are not necessarily lighthouse people. They come from everywhere. More than four times they have sent me parking. <laughs> Meanwhile, I have a parking slot in the place. But they just come and say, it's like it's full. Move to the side. <laughs> and these people, they came to the church only in 2007. <laughs> Do you know how long I've been there for? But for me, it's comic relief. So I just park a little bit. Like I smile and I just stay there. Then every time the head usher is the only one who bails me out. So he comes and says, Oh, Sister Mommy. Then he opens the door. And then the people are like, Eh. <laughs> Church members have faced me in the church. When I have not felt like talking, I'm minding my own business. I'm sure you've heard this story. I came one morning minding my own business, tired. You know how some, some of the days you don't feel like talking to anybody, you just feel like being by yourself. And then I saw somebody say, let me try and go and do deep sea fishing. It's a labor of love. So I went and I said, oh, sister, praise the Lord. Have you been coming to church here? Yes. <laughs> I said, oh, is this something? She said, oh, yeah, I've been coming for about two years now. I said, oh, that's great. So what's your name? And she mentioned her name. I work here and all that. And she had some children. Are your children? Oh, yes. I'm even going to get two of them. There are four. I said, oh, okay. So if you've been coming for two years, have you thought of joining a ministry? I mean, why? You see people know they should join ministries. They should. Why? <laughs> oh, and I don't feel like talking. And I've gone to bring myself. I was quiet, but I could have said, do you know who you are speaking to? That's right. <laughs> do, you, do you know? You think I don't have anything to do that I came to talk to you? And, but I believe that the Holy Ghost said to me that this woman has problems. And many people who are unpleasant, they have a lot of problems. And they are dealing with their problems. It's not you, it's their issues. <laughs> so when they see you, it's like we are thinking about something and then you, ah, and people feel you look happy and your life is together and you probably have no problems 
And even that makes you annoying from afar. So some of the people, I know that they are looking for me already. And then it just happened that it coincided with them. <laughs> so after that, we went in for praise and worship. It was the third service. And then I went to sit at my place. I saw visibly the lady opened her mouth. I was like, ah, is that where she sits? Then she may be an important person in the church. <laughs> after that, weeks passed. The Mrs. Adi brought her. So I have this friend. She has a lot of problems. I was talking to her and I said, the best person to speak to will be our first lady. So I brought her to you. So the lady. <laughs> so she was coming to introduce herself. Her name is, I said, oh, I know her. And I mentioned her name. And the lady said, oh, lady pastor, you haven't forgotten. I said, how can I forget? <laughs> how? How on earth will I forget? And then she broke down and she started weeping. So I have an autistic child. I've struggled with this child for years. And in Ghana, there are no resources, no education. So I don't know where to take the child. Now they have a school that they take out, but they didn't have then. So the child is just at home. I don't know how to manage. I mean, she was weeping so much. You know, so I just said, oh, calm down. I have a friend who also has an autistic child in America, so I'll let her send the literature to you, and then you'll teach yourself, and from there you'll be said, so, because of this autistic child, the other three, their lives are on hold. So every time I come to church, I'm tired. Mm. I, 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 I've had enough before I even come. And so when I went to say, why don't you join the ministry? Hey. <laughs> she didn't add it, but as she was talking, I said, oh. when I went to say, why don't you join them? Said, hmm. Do you know where I'm coming from this morning? Do you know what I've battled with before I've come here? Why, you're not coming to tell me? Do you know the time I have? Who told you I can come for ministry meetings? Amen. But she's still in the church and she's flowing by the grace of God. Even when I say, my one bad thing to about me is when people do bad things, I can't recognize them. I forget what you look like, who you are, and all that. When I see you next time, I'll chat with you fully. I will flow fully because I've forgotten. Maybe it's a blessing, an amnesia of some sort. <laughs> but the pride of life could tempt you to say, you know, I also have issues. You have autistic, I also have issues. What, what, what is that? Do you think my life is perfect? Then it becomes an exchange. And then the reason for which we came to the church, the reason for which God called us, has all derailed because of the pride of life. Underneath it is pride. But it looks like, oh, it's just... I'm putting one or two things right. And I'm correcting her. But it's not true. Another time I drove past somebody. Who, as soon as I drove past, just a bit, a little brush, her back bonnet fell down. So I said, hmm, this car. How can that be? It was like a little wind. So anyway, I got to church. Then I called Shirley, my sister. I said, please take this number. I just drove past somebody. She's not quite on the car park, but the bonus has fallen. Tell her, I'll try and fix everything, and I'm sorry and all that. So I went down after church to see some visitors, and then I was called that somebody was looking for me. When I came, the woman was gone, swollen, like anger. I said, oh, are you the one whose car, whatever? I was just wondering, because when I just brushed against it, the thing fell down. So I was wondering whether it had a problem already. She charged. She was very angry. Madam, please. And the ashes will say, oh, she will do it. She's the first lady. First lady, and so what? I know her. Throwing her hands. Hey, it wasn't easy for me. <laughs> so at a point, she was facing me so much that instinctively, I just went to her and I put my hands on her chest. I said, lady, calm down. Calm down. I'll fix it for you. <laughs> it's okay now, please. <laughs> Go with the, the people across the road and see what. And when they went, it was a gulf. There's a hook that holds the things. And the hook had just opened. <laughs> but she had faced me fully. And then my lieutenants came, including Mrs. Saki. And they said, uh-huh, you said this girl has been rude. Mrs. Saki said, this girl, I know her pa. I've counseled her. I've been to her flat. And all her issues, I will go with you to sort her out. Why should she talk to you? I said, it's okay. It's okay. And even Mrs. Saki was spiritual, but I have some less spiritual people. 
We know her. Allow us to sort her out for you. <laughs> Christian sisters. I said, oh, it's okay. Then one of them, the lady was a doctor, so one of them said, this lady, I sit with her at the back of church. During second service, I sit at the back. One of the lady pastors said, she's also a doctor. And Sister Mami, she weeps. Through. Then I said, I think she has problems. And that when I come into church, I'm sure that wherever she sees me from, she feels that my life is perfect. So I don't even have to preach a sermon. I'm just annoying. Just my embodiment and my presence. It's just annoying. Do you understand? It's a, it's a message. So that's why when they said it's the first lady, she said that I know. And so what? Then this lady pastor told me, she sits at the back and she always weeps. Throughout the service, she always weeps, but she does not speak. Then again, Lady Pastor Bridget Marion came and said, there's somebody I think you should really meet. I would like to book a counseling appointment. Said, mm -hmm. There came yours truly. I said, this thing really happens to me. <laughs> when I heard her issues, I understood. <laughs> it wasn't easy. One thing to another, broken relationships, all sorts of things, and... <clears throat> She had even now gone to date a doctor on her ward. And then a Christian sister, when you come to work, then you will be telling the workers that the doctor, he does not perform in bed. You are not married, though. <laughs> you are saying, I say, oh, this is a broken, warped, you know, life. So when the person sees me, and then you come and say that it's just a brush, and then your car, does it have a problem already? Of course. The pride of life destroys churches destroys relationships and makes we ourselves puffed up. And God cannot reach you. Because you are too big. Sometimes you become too big, you can't witness anymore. He said, me nowadays, I do stage ministry. When I meet people one-on-one, -on -one, I've even forgotten how to witness. Hey, even Jesus talked to the woman at, at, from, from Samaria at the well. And then you, you have become too big that you can't even share tracts. When we say we are going out to share tracks, the reason why you are shy is because you have, to, you have a reputation to protect. Amen. But when you walk with God, he will mess up your reputation. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And your reputation will not matter anymore. That's the kind of God we serve. Amen. Amen. When we're at Collegona, we somebody said, put on the radio. The person didn't tell us what was on it. When we turned the radio, insults. Yes, that Dr. Dagi Ward Mills. He's this, he's that, he's that. Somebody spoke in English. Then after that, somebody else took over in Ghana so that we understand it properly. <laughs> <laughs> when you become like that, you are stripped of everything. So then when Bishop Blake Echo came from West Angeles Cathedral to dedicate Adelaide Chapel, Bishop Blake got up there and said, Oh my God, I can just see God's hand upon Bishop Dag. And he's a man of vision, and the Lord is taking that house chapel to whatever. And then my husband came on the stage. I thank Bishop Blake for all the nice things. But it was no strategy that brought us here. It was no administrative foresight. It was beatings and insults. <laughs> That's what brought us here. We hadn't thought of changing premises. When we got to Collegono, we were happy, and we thought this was it. But the insults, the bombing of the offices, coming to 31st night, the whole church is littered with fires. And they say, don't enter. And you look at the person insulting you. You see, at least if somebody should insult you, somebody dignified should insult you. <laughs> but this one, the type of person insulting you, you know, Bishop is standing up there and then they are lined up on the road and the insults are flowing. Big insults, I can't repeat them. And God, to when they go into the language, <laughs> You go to work and you are headlines in the newspaper. But all that, you see, your pride, it will be tested to see if it's there. And God will kill it before he leads you to the next level. So now when I go to the Kodesh, it looks nice. But I don't feel that, hey, this is a very great, I don't, I don't have that feel. Because I know that we came there by grace. It was when we were attacked on that day that Bishop had a small meeting and said, who knows where we can run to, a place of refuge. That is what led us to buy. And even when they said the price, we knew that we couldn't pay. 
You know, some people ask me, so how, how does it feel to be the wife of such a great minister? <laughs> how does it feel to be in the midst of such a great ministry? I just feel that God has done well, but I don't feel great. I don't know how to explain it. I personally don't feel great. And I know that my husband does not feel great. And he told me that leaving the Kodesh was not easy. Because you have led the church all this way for many years. And then God says, go and do healing Jesus' crusade. The church that you have known, the people that you have brought up, the people who have known you as their pastor Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, God calls you and then says that healing Jesus' crusade, start from nothing. From nothing. And leave the church that is established with Ogontia members. I saw one lady. I said, so why did you join the church? I said, who doesn't like beautiful things? <laughs> That's her answer. I said, so what prompted you to join the church? Who doesn't like beautiful things? <laughs> and then now you go and start from scratch with nothing. When the church is strong and vibrant and, and it has a name and is known, God says, give it to somebody else to pastor and you come. Come aside. I need you for another assignment. And now I'm changing you into an evangelist. It's not easy. There are times I have traveled. When I come back, all my ministries have been scrambled. Should I also leave the church? You see, everything you have experienced, I've also experienced. And don't tell me that it's because you are a wife. Because wives leave churches, if you don't know. I have some in the cathedral. The husband is here. The wife goes to Central Gospel. Because she's angry over what I don't know. I went to visit one wife. She didn't even speak to me. I mean, she just looked somewhere. She, pride of life. And nothing to be proud about. When I looked at the surroundings, I said, I've not come to any wild place like this before. But she would not even speak to you. You know, and I think also that the men, you two sometimes, this brother was going to marry a nice spiritual sister. And then you saw this pretty face. And she has nice legs too. And he dumped her. The girl wept. We spoke to him. He has seen this beauty. In a few weeks, they are married. Two weeks, he has come for counsel. I said, ah, it's early. <laughs> it's true, marriage has come, but you, you have come early. Early in the morning. <laughs> and from there, no bishop, no reverend, no pastor can talk to this lady. Oh, above, no nevertheless in her life. <laughs> I was telling my mother, you know, sometimes... People really are incorrigible. You can't speak to them. You can I said a certain guy was going to marry someone. My mother said, men, the trees they plant are the same trees that are used as canes to beat them. <laughs> the pride of life. So she goes to her own chair. Whether the children are affected, whether the church of God is affected, is me, meism. And it's pride because you feel you are somebody. You feel we should have informed you. You feel we should have given you an invitation card. You feel that we should have included you in what we were doing. I was telling you, I traveled, and when I came, all my ministry, oh, I had a nice, thriving ministry. No women in direction, this ministry, this ministry. When I look at it, oh, oh what a calling. <laughs> and then I was in London, Mrs. Saki called me laughing. Oh, you don't have chapel anymore. I said, oh, what are you saying? I said, oh. They've taken your chapel. They've shared it for people. I said, oh, when did this happen? She said, oh, two weeks ago. Ah, but don't you know? I said, I don't know. Then she was laughing so hard. She said, so you mean they didn't inform me? I said, they didn't inform me. So when I went back to Ghana, they said all the new chapels are meeting. So they met. All the pastors, basements, I think. So if you are the pastor of Timothy Chapel, you move here with your sheep. So, you, so we are all sitting there. Then, okay, you move here. You move here. Yours truly. I don't have sheep. Everybody has gone. <laughs> I said, ah, but why would they even not inform me? I just come and then you are doing something new. And you know who did that, don't you? <laughs> so after they've shared the people, I said, do you have any questions? You see, when I go for staff meetings, and I am not a wife. I'm a member of staff. Right. So I put up my hand and I said, oh, my ministries have been shared. So from here, I don't know what, what, what is the next step, what I'm doing. Then my husband said, yes. Uh, some of the questions we'll answer later. Yes, you, sister. 
Sister this, sister that. Yes, you, brother this. They all finished. Then at the end, ah, my wife, I just want to tell you that you do well in the trenches, so I'm sending you there. That's why. Meet. Okay, shall we pray? <laughs> Couldn't believe it. It was gone. I said, every time I'm being sent back, every time, you know, at the point so many pastors were released from my ministry, I was not happy. So I came to complain about it. I said, Lady Pastor Doris, Pastor Arthur, Pastor Ashi, Pastor Big Daddy, Pastor Jonathan Eni, you are taking all these people. My husband said, it shows that you are gifted. You bring them up to pastoral level, and then they are released into ministry. I said, ah. So who will help me? My just they have to go. And they have to bear fruit. Can't you see? I have to see. <laughs> So it has happened time and time and time again. And I said, but when this last one happens, I'm, I'm tired. So I said, so what will I do now? So I'm thinking about it. Another time he called me, he said, you have to go into the trenches and then find members and establish a message. So the ministry, what's the mission, the vision? So your ministry is special. They meet twice a month. <laughs> hey, a ministry that meets twice, yes. And they are called Compassion International. I said, so what do they do? Oh, people who struggle to be, you know, regular ministry members, and then they will join. And so, where will I get members from? Ah, the way you start a ministry, that's how. <laughs> so, by the grace of God, it wasn't easy, but I started. And today, compassion, at least on our paper, we are about 70. Wow. And we thank God for that. <laughs> the pride of life. But the pride of life won't let you come from zero to nothing. And I see that it's something God keeps doing. He takes you and he takes, he takes away from you and starts you all over again. Takes it away from you. So when Pastor Kakra was transferred to Sakumon, another branch out of Kumasi, I heard Bishop tell him, you remind me of myself. How God used me for the Kodesh and then said, give it up and come. Let's start all over again. That's what's happening to you now. But if you can guard your heart and keep faithful, God will be faithful to you. You, I could easily also have had pride of life. I've gone. You have taken my ministries and shared. I'm going. I'm no more going to be involved in such things. Because after all, there's something called church protocol. I mean, which you should observe. Mm. <laughs> Fine protocol doesn't permit certain things that you should know. The pride of life. Unforgiveness, the root of it is pride. I should be wronged and I should forgive you. I'm not releasing you. And many homes and relationships are broken because of pride. Satan fell because of pride. He said, I will. I will. I will. But every great man of God came to God and said, who am I that you should use me? David sat in front of God and said, who am I that you should bless me so much? Who am I that you should call me? It is that spirit that God respects and likes. And when he sees that, then he says, come. In this part of the world, the pride of life can kill you. Because you feel that I have everything. You see the church in Revelation says, I have need of nothing. I'm rich. I have everything. God says that you are blind. You need eye salve. You are naked. You are poor. But your pride doesn't let you see things as they should be. So Switzerland may look wealthy, quote and unquote, but in spirit, they are very poor. Hallelujah. And that spirit of this land can catch you. Pride of life. At first when God brought you, you were humble. But now as he started to lift you up, and you started to change the kind of cars you drive and all that, you so, are calling us to a meeting. Where will I get parking for my Benz? <laughs> but at first you humbly took the bus. But now you have your Benz and we, we dare not call you out of it. The pride of life. It's a deception. The Bible says this world and all that it has passes away. But he who does the will of the Father abideth forever. Amen. If we want to abide forever, it is doing the will of the Father. And God, you see, we, we, are, we are not stagnant as human beings. God will promote you. God will raise you. But when you get to that position, what do you do? Sometimes in the ministry, when God lifts people up, they become complacent. It's like, oh, now... I'm a big man. I don't pray anymore. <laughs> Quiet time is for believers and little new believers. 
Now, I don't look in my Bible anymore. I catch direct revelation. <laughs> Even Paul, who met God in the second, seventh heavens and third heavens, he said that, study to show yourself approved unto God. And how come you, you feel that now the Bible is aside? The pride of life. When God says, you have worked, give me a tenth. You say, God, you like it too much. But when they give you a bonus of a tenth, you say it's small. When you have to give God a tenth, you say, is, is it God? Or is it the pastor? Is it really God? Or is it, but when you pay hospital bills, you don't. But when the Lord who healeth you touches you, you can't pay his bills. You can't pay for good health. You can't pay for God's protection. But pride makes you think that there's something here that somebody is coming for. Pride. The pride of life. That's why God said, when you have built goodly houses, when you have eaten well and you have grown fat, then you shall not forget the Lord your God. Because pride makes you forget. And a grateful heart comes from a humble heart. The Bible says, humble yourselves. If you are not humble, you can't marry. If you are not humble, you cannot marry. So the single ones amongst us, you want to marry, huh? Like Pastor Jacob said, marriage will wash you like homo. <laughs> so if you are ready to be washed like homo, if you are ready to be selfless, then come. Because when he says wives, submit, it means wives, be secondary to. And you are used to being primary to yourself. And now he's saying be secondary to. It's not easy. Be malleable. When I have my plans, I should be malleable to go where? Pride will not let you forgive. Pride will not let you let up. So if you don't have that spirit or are not allowing God to cultivate, please don't go and say I do to somebody's son. <laughs> don't go and say I do to somebody's daughter. And give the person, the person says, oh, this thing you did, I think it's wrong. Said, How can it be wrong? Because you, you are God. You never do wrong. Every problem in the marriage is one-sided. You, you are perfect. Can that be? How can that be? Everybody plays a part. Even if your part is 5%, you have a part. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life. May the Lord deliver us from pride. Amen. Because it's subtle. Amen. It cannot be seen with the naked eye. But God is working on our hearts. Pride. Let it go and say, I'm sorry. And when he says, what are you sorry for? You see, somebody told me. That's why I don't say sorry to my husband. Because when I go and say sorry, he said, what are you sorry for? He said, ah, but you know what happened. So what are you sorry for? Okay, I'm sorry for this. this, this. And so what you did, do you think then the whole thing has become, <laughs> has become a convention? And lady pastor, I don't appreciate it. You know, but if you are able to say, I'm sorry, even with God, we are not able to acknowledge our sins. We call them other things. He struggles with us. We say it's not that. It's something else. And God says, it's this. Pride will not let us accept. And therefore, he cannot draw us near. But I believe that this afternoon, the Lord is setting us free Amen. from the pride of life. And we are becoming what we ought to be. Stand to your feet, please. <laughs> the pride of life. Shall we pray? I believe that the spirit of pride or the pride of life comes when like Nebuchadnezzar, we say within ourselves and we reason with ourselves that everything is by our might, everything is by our power, and everything is from our own hard work. But if God is to take your health from you, if God is to take oxygen from you, if God is to stop your feet from functioning and your legs from functioning, then you will know that it doesn't depend on you. It depends on him. I want us to open our hearts and say, Lord, forgive us for the times when we've been proud. Pride has led us to offenses. Pride has led us to broken relationships. Pride has led us to not doing anything in the church of God. Because we can't stand being spoken about. But tonight, this afternoon, we come to the altar and we lay our pride on the altar. And we allow ourselves to die that Jesus may be magnified. Humble yourselves. In the sight of the Lord, and He will.
lift you up humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you he will lift you up he will yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up he will lift you up he will lift you up humble yourself in the sight of the Lord I sense the Lord is healing our lives. He's touching us in many broken places that have come about because of pride. Because of pride, you can't stand to be offended. But the Bible says about Jesus being reviled, he reviled not. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him who judged faithfully. It's time to leave things to God. It's time to let God fight your battles for you. It's time to become nothing like John the Baptist. We have to say, I must decrease, but he must increase. You are not obeying God's call because of pride. Because of human beings and what they will say and what they will do. But God is saying, humble yourself in my sight and I will lift you up. The Bible says, God resists the proud. I would not like to be resisted by God. But he gives grace to the humble. May grace come to your life as you humble yourself before him today. I want you to speak to him in tongues. I want you to mean everything that you say. Open your mouth and speak to God. Open your mouth and ask him, Lord, I may not even know, but search me and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any pride in me, oh God, and do away with it so that I can receive grace from you. For you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. Every offense in the church, every offense amongst church members is a cause of pride. How, how dare her talk to me like that? How dare her treat me like that? But God is the one with whom we have to do. Oh, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you. Mean the prayer. Let it come from the depths of your heart. Let God speak to you. He will lift you up. Oh, he will lift you up. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. He will lift you up. He will. I see God lift you up because of your obedience. I see God lifting you up because you have allowed him to make you nothing, to make you of no reputation, and he himself will lift you up. He will lift you up. Father, thank you for your word that has come to us. For pride is like a chemical reaction that goes on quietly but destroys us. I pray for healing in the church of God. I pray that pride will go out and humility will come in. I pray, oh God, that the times that you have been resisting us in our lives because of our pride will come to an end. But that rather in humility, we will receive grace to walk with you and to be all that you want us to be. The shameful times that we have been through, the reproaches in our lives are all places that we come through so that you will get rid of our pride. Things that we didn't want to happen to us so that we'll keep our reputation intact, Lord. You have scrambled all of them for your glory and for your I pray that the spirit of humility will come into us and upon us. I pray that a new season, a new phase, a new level of ministry, a new place of our walk with you will come forth. Deliver us from the pride of life, the pride of the things that this world offers us. May we never think that you are a hindrance, a bother like a fly in our ears. But may we know that whatever we have, we receive from you. 
Forgive us and give us a new beginning. New grace, O oh God. For you resist the proud. But this afternoon your children receive grace because they walk in humility. Thank you for answered prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Please take your seat.